By the beginning of March 1945, the Western Allies advancing on a broad front were closing up on the River Rhine, the last great natural barrier between them and Germany's heartland. Up until that point, the Germans had destroyed all the river's bridges the Americans came across. Yet on March 7, at the small German town of Remagen, the American 9 Armored Division came across an intact bridge over the Rhine, the Ludendorff Bridge. They needed to capture it to ensure the Rhine crossing by armored units, something that was only been possible in dribs and drabs so far using small infantry patrols and rafts. In turn, the Germans realized the bridge's strategic importance and went all out to try and destroy the Ludendorff Bridge. On March 7, the 7th Corps of the US 1st Army had reached the Rhine at Cologne, but the Germans had destroyed all the bridges across the river. About 72 kilometers to the south lay the town of Remagen, overlooking the Ludendorff Bridge, spanning the Rhine. At 12.56 p.m. that day, the men of A Company, 27th Armored Infantry Battalion, reached the top of a gorge on the Rhine's west bank to find themselves staring down an intact bridge over the river. The men were somewhat surprised because, like I said, up until that point, all the bridges had been blown up by the Germans. The unit commanded by 22-year-old Lieutenant Carl Timmerman traveled in the half-track military vehicle accompanied by four Pershing M26 tanks. They were part of Task Force Engemann. The task force was part of Brigade Generals William Hoke's Combat Command B of 9th Armored Division. Its orders were to capture the town of Remagen before turning south to link up with other units of their division. Once they arrived at Remagen, Timmermann and his men saw what was left of the Germans' exodus, often with horse-drawn carriages and battered vehicles rolling over the bridge in a disorganized manner. Timmermann radioed Engemann and informed him it appeared the Ludendorff Bridge was intact. Engemann in turn quickly made his way to the bridge. The men did a quick reconnaissance and Engemann decided he didn't want to risk a drive down the narrow, steep-sided road running below the vantage point into town. It was the ideal setting for an ambush, and the Germans were still roaming on their side of the river. Instead, Timmermann's company was ordered to move down a wooded track to clear Remagen's outskirts. After this, the four Pershings under the command of Lieutenant John Grimble would join them. Before too long, three platoons were skirmishing through the streets of Remagen, moving from building to building, dispersing a German patrol and capturing the railway station in town. By 2.20pm, Grimble's tanks joined, slowly rolling down the town path by the river. Here they began to lay down suppressive fire across the bridge to prevent any sudden enemy movement. Although the Allied troops could see the Germans on the east bank, the Germans managed to shelter themselves off in the tunnel into which the rail line ran at the basalt cliff base. Forty odd minutes later, Timmermann and his number three platoon arrived at the town cemetery, close to the two granite towers at the western end of Ludendorff Bridge. So far, the Americans had encountered barely any resistance. Meanwhile, on the German side, Rimagen's defense had not really been a priority of Field Marshal Walter Modell. He was the German Army Group B commander and was looking to the north and south of Rimagen for American assault crossings of the Rhine. So. When the Americans tried to take over the bridge without damaging it too much, they only faced weak and relatively uncoordinated resistance from the Germans. They faced a squad of engineers, 60 members of the Volkssturm, and some Luftwaffe anti-aircraft gunners operating a battery of 20mm flak guns, which started firing at the Americans. To be fair, they were far from an intimidating bunch. The Germans fell under Major Willy Brache's command, who higher ups authorized to start preparing the bridge's demolition. However, the bridge's master, a local man, could only gather around 590 kilos of low-grade industrial explosive. Still, he attached the explosive to the girders of the bridge's central span. The commander of the engineer squad, Captain Karl Friesenhahn, also used some of the scarcely available explosives. He booby-trapped the approach ramp to the bridge on the west bank. He had built the ramp earlier to enable vehicles to drive up on the bridge and cross on the wooden planks laid over the rails. If the bridge wasn't blown up, it would make the crossing so much easier for the Americans. Accompanying Brache was Hans Scheller, the representative of Major General Hitzfeld, the senior officer responsible for the Ludendorff Bridge. Hitzfeld had ordered Scheller to keep the bridge open for as long as possible so the troops under his command had an escape route. Now, while Scheller agonized about blowing the bridge up, the American tanks began nosing down the town path. 
Twenty minutes later, Engelmann realized this was the time to strike. He issued a precise command to seize the Ludendorff Bridge. Timmermann and his men now faced a daunting prospect of taking an objective which literally at any moment could explode beneath their feet. Within two minutes, their nervous deliberations were interrupted by a heavy explosion as Friesenan detonated the approach ram's charges. When the smoke cleared, the bridge was still standing, albeit a bit damaged. The explosive didn't manage to destroy the bridge. Timmerman immediately ordered his company to seize the bridge. Soldiers scrambled through the craters to the bridge where there was a second explosion. The Ludendorff Bridge now flew in the air and settled again. The main charges too had been blown up, but part of the electrical firing mechanism had filled. The American tanks on the west bank continued their firing while Task Force Engemann positioned their assault guns and launched a barrage of firing. One of Friesenhan's engineers, Sergeant Faust, ran through the firing from both sides to ignite the fuse and the manual firing box on the bridge. Managing to light the fuse, Faust only returned to the tunnel shelter when the charges went off. Huge chunks of debris crashed into the Rhine, but still, after the smoke cleared, the bridge stood tall. Although the central span was twisted at this point, and there was a gaping hole in the flooring, under heavy fire by the Germans, the Americans now zigzagged their way across the bridge. The machine guns in the eastern tower were quickly silenced, and the first Allied soldier set foot on the east bank of the Rhine. It was Sergeant Alex Drobik, squad leader in number 3 platoon. Considering he ran near 400 meters over the bridge, taking fire from the Germans, while the charges under the bridge could blow up at any minute, this was quite the feat. For his bravery, he was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. By 4 p.m., about 75 American troops had passed safely across the bridge, taking their first surrendering German prisoners. Behind these soldiers, Allied engineers were cutting cables and hurling undetonated charges into the Rhine. There was still an explosion hazard, and the bridge was vital to the transport of armored divisions. As the bridgehead at Remagen expanded, the Germans threw some desperate counterattacks to destroy the bridge. All of them filled. Over a week after the Allies had secured the bridge, the Luftwaffe was still trying to bomb it, together with the three tactical bridges the US engineers erected alongside it. They even sent V-2 guided long-range missiles. All of these missed their targets, but did kill German civilians living in the vicinity of the bridge. Ten days after the bridge was secured on March 17, the Ludendorff Bridge finally toppled into the Rhine. Not without casualties, though, 28 Allied troops died during the collapse. In terms of logistics, the destruction wasn't too worrying. The Americans had already established a bridgehead and two emergency bridges, ensuring Germany's penetration by Allied armored units. The German defenders of the bridge were charged in absentia. Friesenan was acquitted and Brache was sentenced to death. The crossing of the Rhine by the Americans had done a lot of good for the Allied troops invading Germany and was a crucial blow, albeit one of many, to the German morale. Thank you for watching this video. If there's a topic or event you'd like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in a comment. I would also really like to thank all my patrons and channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and want to support my work, consider checking me out on Patreon or becoming a channel member. For just $1 a month, you will already gain access to the exclusive Patreon series. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.